That's just to wake you up. <laughs> um, today I want to talk to you about um, marketing and World Cup for Coca-Cola. Um, my name is Martin Alvarda. I'm Vice President of Coca-Cola in charge of the department that we call Total Media Communication, which is a group of people that look after all forms of communication. Mass media, so as television, radio, newspapers, outdoor, um, and also non-traditional forms of media such as uh, events, sponsorship, um, and um, celebrities, and so on and so forth, and also PR, and um, the whole area of uh, electronic media, so digital and uh, web media. So that's what I'm in charge of, and one of the projects at my department that was the World Cup project, and that is what I'm going to talk about today. If I talk too fast, please slow me down, um, and um, at the end there will be time for some questions, so if you have any questions, write them down, and um, I will uh, try and answer them as honestly as possible. Before I talk about World Cup, let me explain a little bit about Coca-Cola Japan. Uh, we've been here a long time, since 1957. Uh, we are the number one software manufacturer in Japan. We have 15 bottlers across Japan, from Hokkaido to Okinawa. We have more than 25 brands, more than 60 different beverages, more than 1 million vending machines that I'm sure you're familiar with. And we are basically in all categories of soft drinks, uh, coffee, tea, Obviously, soft drinks itself, such as Coca-Cola and Fanta, juices such as Minute Maid and Cool, lactic drinks such as uh, Lactia, sports and energy drinks such as Aquarius or Mineral Balance, health and wellness drinks such as Pocket Doctor, uh, water, Mori Mamizu, and soup in the winter, <laughs> made by the Iron Chef. Oh. <laughs> um, our company is basically a marketing company. For us, marketing is our key and marketing is our strength. Um, and um, we were recognized as probably the number one marketing company in Japan in 2001 when we won basically all the prizes that you can win for our advertising and our marketing efforts from the ACC. And that had never happened before. Coca Cola Japan is the first company to get such a result. A little bit of history about World Cup. Um, there won't be a quiz afterwards, so you can relax, so you don't have to memorize all these numbers. <laughs> and, uh, 1930 was the first World Cup in Uruguay. In 1970, uh, Coca-Cola became the partner in the uh, World Cup in Mexico. And 2002 World Cup was the 17th uh, edition of World Cup. And for those of you who are more speaking more American English than English English, I just want to make sure that football is football and not soccer. We call football football. And football, basically, for a lot of people around the world, including Japan, is religion. And I have a little video to show how passionate Japanese fans are about football, and especially the national team. Well, in the 
video, but I think it gives a very good visual impression of how passionate Japanese uh, football fans and Asian football fans, a little bit of Korea there as well, are about football. Let me explain some basics about the World Cup. The 2002 World Cup was uh, special in many ways. It was the first World Cup that was held in the, uh, in the Asian uh, area, on the Asian continent. It was the first ever World Cup that was co-hosted by two countries. And I think, um, from my observation and discussions with people, it was probably also the last World Cup that was ever co-hosted between two nations, because the logistics, uh, or the implications of the logistics, meant that basically we were organizing two World Cups at the same time, instead of one. And so I think it was the first time, probably also the last time. Um, obviously the dates, May 31 was the opening uh, match, uh, June 30 was the final in Yokohama. Uh, 10 venues in Korea, 10 in Japan. 32 teams uh, qualified, um, 16 in each country. Uh, as I said, opening match in Seoul and the final was in Yokohama. The worldwide partners uh, for the event are on this page. There are um, basically uh, 15 partners, they all have their, each have their um, exclusive area which is defined very specifically in the contract. Those contracts tend to be about 165 pages of legal language. The actual contract is not so big but it's the appendix that explain all the details that are uh, very, very long. So um, uh, it's a complicated negotiation process. Um, you can especially imagine if you are, um, uh, let's see, uh, Philips, or Fuji Xerox, or JVC, or Toshiba, you're all sort of close to each other in terms of competition. So you have to define very clearly which area is your area, which area is not. Uh, we are the only software in the company, the only other beverage within the uh, worldwide official partners is Budweiser beer. Uh, there are also some official Japanese suppliers which are listed uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, I wish Tepco had uh, spent their money on uh, safeguarding the uh, uh, nuclear facilities rather than spending it on the World Cup as <laughs> We had uh, 10 venues, as said, um, across Japan, and um, I also explained that we have 15 bottlers. Um, that means that uh, basically every bottler is um, somehow involved in the World Cup, um, either because they are in a host city, um, and you can see here which bottlers uh, were part of uh, the host city network, but then there were also the campsites for the teams, which sometimes were in a different area. Um, we had uh, the hub cities such as um, Tokyo, which was not a World Cup city, but obviously very important as a traffic hub or Nagoya. Um, so basically every bottler was somehow involved in, uh, in World, uh, World Cup execution. Um, TV viewership for World Cups in uh, Japan have been very, very high. The World Cup 94 qualifying uh, matches um, uh, had an average household rating, or sorry, high, highest household rating of 50, which meant that half of the country's population was watching uh, the qualifying for World Cup USA 94. Japan did not qualify, as maybe some of you remember. Um, in 98, uh, Japan did qualify for the first time for World Cup in France, and the highest household rating was 61, which was actually accomplished in um, the last match that Japan played against Jamaica which was kind of a make or break match for Japan, and so there was a very high percentage of people viewing. If you consider that these matches were broadcast in a different time zone than, you know, prime time, these are incredibly high ratings. So we, were, we had high expectations for World Cup night, uh, in 2002, and we have a new record. Um, the uh, highest house, household rating uh, was actually 66 this time. So it's definitely been a, uh, a record-breaking event from a TV viewership. And, by the way, in those numbers, it's not included out-of-home viewing, so people that went to, like, Tokyo Dome or any of the other domes to watch a match uh, with, uh, uh, in, not in an actual stadium, but in an out-of-home situation, or in bars, restaurants, offices, and so on and so forth. So the actual rating might be closer to 70. Okay, rather than me explaining the basics of World Cup, I thought I'd show you another video which explains a little bit about the history of World Cup and uh, also a little bit about um, some of the uh, uh, numbers of World Cup. Thank you. 
で、三十一億円。
brand Coca-Cola is the world's most recognized and most valuable brand name. Um, it is said that um, after the word OK, the word Coca-Cola has the widest recognition around the world uh, among people of all languages. Um, so that's not the reason. The real reason is to, to use this as a tool to differentiate ourselves from competition and to sort of create an event where people would say, yeah, only Coca-Cola could do that kind of thing. And to use it as a business building tool for our uh, customers and consumers. That's it, it's very simple. To sell more product is the, uh, is the actual goal. This is all of the stuff that would happen around global events. These are the list up that I mentioned before. The easy part is the part you're on the left. That's advertising, instead of placing the media, it's creating the promotions, it is uh, creating some uh, PR, local publicity, and customer marketing. That's what we do every day as a company. That's the, that's the stuff that we're used to doing. That, that's the kind of thing that we, uh, that we are good at, uh, or at least we like to think that we're good at. It's all the other stuff on the, stuff on the right hand side that also needs to happen that makes this such a complicated project and uh, um, requires you know, very thorough planning. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the planning process a little bit later on. Talk about that. The hard part, as I said, is this logistics, venue operations, human resources, and so on and so forth. So it takes time to prepare. We started in 99. I arrived here in Japan in March of 99. And my very first day in the office, uh, very first meeting was the World Cup kickoff meeting for World Cup 2002. So in 1999, we spent time on making sure that we understood what we could do and make sure that not just the, the project team, the whole company understood what we could do, how we were going to do that, and to, to develop some sort of framework as, as to how to get through this whole process to 2002. In 2002, we developed a detailed framework, and then of course we needed to make sure that our senior management agreed with that because the framework came with a cost calculation, and so that needed to be um, and then we had to develop the 2001 plan. Um, some of you might remember that in 2001 there was a World Cup test event uh, called the Confederations Cup that was held here in Japan in three stadiums in the month of June. Um, and so we needed to plan for that as well because that was a great opportunity for us to test everything that we wanted to do in 2002, in 2001. We also went to um, two other events where we felt we could learn, so we brought a lot of people that were going to work on World Cup 2002 to Euro 2000, which is played in Holland and Belgium, and to Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, and that was a good opportunity for people to learn and to understand kind of the impact of the event. So in December 2000, we finalized our plans for 2001 and the first six months of 2001. In the year 2001, we obviously activated and managed the Confederations Cup. We started the detailed plan development for 2002. We finalized our human resources strategy and our hiring process. We, um, after the Confederations Cup was held, Coca-Cola typically does a what we call an after-action review or a detailed evaluation of how it all went. As I said, we used Confederations Cup as a test event, so everything that we wanted to do at World Cup, we did during the Confederations Cup, so we had a great opportunity to find out what worked, what doesn't work. And um, we did that um, after we had the spin. We held our final planning session in October with all the function groups. Function groups are human resources, legal, finance, brand teams, um, uh, our Atlanta colleagues, our Korean colleagues, etc. So it's sort of information sharing. We also invited FIFA to that so that they knew what we were going to do, and our bottlers obviously as well. And then in November, I can remember it very clearly, November of 2001, all of a sudden there was this magic moment where we were no longer planning, and all of a sudden we were making things. We were actually ordering things from agencies and booking space and starting with the actual execution, which was a very exciting time, uh, because it meant that from March 99 to November of 2001, we had been planning. We had not actually been doing that much, and all of a sudden we were actually doing this, this real memorable moment. And then there was the year 2002, and I always say, sort of jokingly, um, our activation implementation meant we had 1,001 things to do in 2002. I could easily say we had 2,002 things to do in 2002. It's just a huge project that we had to all of a sudden implement. Um, obviously, we had to manage our expanding team because there came a lot of people from the beginning of that year came on board. Um, also, our agencies got actively involved. And of course, our Atlanta headquarter people started um, uh, sending people here to manage uh, the event as well. And in June, it sounds very simple. We delivered the event, 
but that was the culmination of uh, almost uh, three and a half years of work. And from spring through July, I also worked on reassigning the project team members so that once the event was finished and they had finalized everything and paid all the bills and, and managed everything, that they could go to their next assignment. So people, during the event, I didn't want to have people worrying about, well, what am I going to do next? Because that means they're distracted from their, from their most important time of this project. So we didn't want to have that, that distraction. So we made sure that we started looking for their next assignment. In August, we did our after action review. And in November, um, next month, we will brief Germany on what it is to be a World Cup uh, country. And so part of this presentation will also be shown in, in Germany. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, what we wanted to do with uh, World Cup as a company. Um, we developed what we call a vision. And um, we defined our vision for World Cup as um, First, we need to understand the background a little bit. So, World Cup 2002, our vision was that that is a unique marketing asset for our Coca-Cola system in Japan. And it is unique because it's so multidimensional. It really touches on every aspect of the organization. Um, it's a powerful consumer marketing uh, property, advertising, sales promotion, customer activation, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's also really unique because it brings the event to specific local markets where Bobos have their business. Because we have these 10 venues, we have got the uh, campsites, the official hotels, and so on and so forth. And as an internal motivation tool, it's also very, very strong because obviously it's a great way to um, uh, give people some pride in where they work and, 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 uh, and why they work so hard for this, uh, for this company. One other very important aspect of our vision is that we don't want to do just something that creates a blip, but we want to do something that creates an increase and then maintains that increase after the event is over. So that was a very important um, other part of the vision. We should target long-term business results that remain after the event rather than just a one-time increase. Um, so we defined our system objective in three pillars. We wanted to use World Cup to create brand equity, so increase the value of our brands, to generate sustainable profitable volume, which meant uh, volume uh, increase that would um, be maintained after the event and to increase Coca-Cola Japan system motivation, so the pride and the, the joy and the energy that people feel about their work um, by utilizing World Cup as, well, as I said, a 360 degree or multi-dimensional marketing asset. In the old days, what we used to do is when we had uh, an event like this, is uh, the strategy would translate into just paint the town red, Coca-Cola everywhere. That was kind of our old strategy. Um, we would give things away, like tickets or whatever. We just give it away, and there was not really sort of like a, a link to our business objective. There was a lot of favoritism. If I like you, I'll give you a ticket. Or if I like this customer, I'll, I'll invite them, whether they're a good business partner or not. It didn't really matter so much. And basically, there were no measurable goals. There, were no, there was not really accountability whether the investment that we were making in this type of event actually paid back. So that was the old thinking. Today's thinking is that where we start is to understand the event itself and to understand what quality or what value this team can have and what are its characteristics, what are its unique aspects. And so let's understand the event first. The event is a brand in itself, and so let's understand that brand. And the next step is to link the, the let's say, brand values of the event to the brand values of our brands and to see where there's a logical connection or a logical link. And ultimately, we don't want to create one plus one is two, but we want to create one plus one is three or three plus, something that creates a really unique combination. We want to not just give away things, but we want to link giving away things to business goals. So if we do a consumer promotion with tickets, then you've got to buy some product first. And if you buy a product, then we'll give you the possibility to win a ticket. Um, if, as a customer, if you're the president of 7-Eleven, we're not going to just give you a ticket, but we want to invite you because you're important to our business and we do some sort of deal about a promotion or something like that. So not just give away and not get something in return. As I said before, our goal is very simple. We want to sell more product. And so everything that we do, we want to link to business results. And as I said, uh, you know, we want to actually find out afterwards if it pays back, if our investment was worth it. So we capture the learnings and the results and we are accountable for what we do. So after all of that, that was also like the planning and the strategy. What did we actually do? Let's talk first about our flagship brand, brand called Coca. Um, the marketing activities um, were basically threefold. We had, of course, our No Reason campaign, which is running for two years now. And we 
rather than creating separate World Cup campaign, decided to integrate World Cup into the No Reason campaign. Um, then we organized a national promotion in two waves. Wave one was a ticket promotion, and wave two was an original World Cup goods promotion. And although it was branded Coca-Cola, we used it also across other brands so that all our uh, key brands could uh, benefit from um, World Cup activation. So, sorry for the abbreviations, KO is Coca-Cola, DKO is Diet Coca-Cola, Fanta, Aquarius, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, Silken Beecha, Marocha, Love Body, and Chavo were all included in the uh, World Cup uh, promotion. And then we developed for specific uh, stores or outlets, we developed specific customer or channel promotions as well. I'm going to show you some of those examples. Um, one other very important aspect of thinking about what I said before, creating legacies or creating something that is not just a blip but continues afterwards. When we created our uh, 2002 activity calendar, we planned for 12 months, not just for World Cup. So this is our 12-month calendar. This part is obviously totally dominated by World Cup. But once the event is over, the year wasn't over. I mean, the year doesn't end with World Cup. So we have our summer promotion, we have our year-end promotion, which will be another um, Harry Potter uh, promotion this year, which is about to uh, start. And so we plan for a whole year, because otherwise you do create a blip, and afterwards, you know, uh, competition moves in. So we had a full 12-year calendar, uh, rather than a, a six-month uh, program around the World Cup. This is the media activity. Just wanted to show you, you know, just again, how complicated the animal gets uh, with um, both main thrust, which is our general campaign and promotional activities, and um, then the fact that we had these two waves, wave one was, which was tickets and wave two which was World Cup groups. Um, so this is all the sort of communication that we ran over that period of time. Packaging was also adapted, so we had um, our regular package, um, but we also had a World Cup campaign uh, package, and we had limited sales for OWB stands for one-way bottle, which is the glass bottle that you could get at the Princess 7 Eleven with very specific World Cup uh, branding on it. And we also had a bottle can and uh, limited edition in, uh, in April. So our packaging was also part of the communication uh, process. The National Promotion, I'm sure you will have seen, maybe even collected these kind of seals from the packaging. Um, the, the reason we do this is a World Cup ticket is very expensive. And the Japanese law says that you can't just give away any price. The, the value of the price is linked to the product that you buy. So in order to give away a more expensive product relative to the uh, product price, we have to make people buy more product before they can actually qualify for such a price. So that's why we have this points mechanism in Japan. Um, this was the key visual for the um, ticket promotion. Um, and. Um, even if you didn't win the ticket promotion, you could still, as it's explained there at the bottom, you could still qualify for some other routes as well. Um, phase two was the um, exclusive World Cup routes. Um, I'll uh, skip the commercial, it's just a 15 second commercial. For the first time ever, we worked together with one of the other World Cup partners, Adidas, to create a co branded shoe. Adidas had never done a, a shoe that had a different brand name on it, um, so we created this uh, exclusive shoe. Of this was actually a new shoe that came out um, on the back of World Cup and it comes in like five or six different colors. But this color, in this edition, you could only, be get, uh, you could only get this to the Coca-Cola promotion. The other key prize that we gave away in the second phase was the Digital Home Theater, another uh, World Cup partner, JPC Victor, and um, that was also very, very popular. And then, as I said, even if you didn't win one of the big prizes like tickets or one of those um, shoes or whatever, then you could still qualify in the mileage program for some pin sets uh, and other uh, World Cup uh, goods. <clears throat> we also did some on-pack promotions in phase one. We had the uh, Lego on-pack, so you could collect the whole football team and other you know, stuff uh, with Lego. Lego, as you know, it became a bit of a hype in Japan uh, in the last uh, 12 months. I think it's sort of over the top now. I think it's uh, going uh, down. But, um, we still had this, uh, this Lego promotion that worked very, very well. And in phase two, which ran through the end of World Cup, we had the uh, player figurines, so there's famous football players that you can collect um, in the uh, convenience stores as well. And as I explained, we had customer marketing promotions, so specific promotions that only ran in one channel. Uh, this is a promotion that ran in the vending channel, where we did a joint promotion with Cup Noodle, um, and uh, that worked very, very well. 
and we also did some uh, tailor-made promotions. Uh, the one at the bottom right is a promotion that we did together with Lawson where you could uh, collect uh, a unique pin set that you would only get at Lawson. So if you bought a product at Lawson, you could collect those pins. And we did that at 7 and we did that with most supermarkets. Each key national chain had their own promotion. Of course, we were also active uh, in the interactive area. Online, we had uh, a pooling game where basically you can make predictions about who was going to win each group and who was going to win the semis and, and so on and so forth with the prices. The price that you could win throughout that whole process was the official match ball of um, all the matches that were played. So you would actually get the ball from the match with a certificate from FIFA that this is the original match ball. So we had 32 balls and we could give it actually 35, we had a few extra from the uh, Japan. Um, we also had a knowledge quiz, and if you won that, you could download, get some free downloads like a screensaver or something like that. Um, on iMode, we had the national anthem, the national flag, the official anthem, all sorts of downloads that you could do there. And um, uh, as part of our promotion, you could go online and find out your, the chances, the odds of winning tickets for a certain match or uh, any, anything like that. So, related to our promotion. This was the uh, startup page uh, for our. Internet presence that started in February 20. And these are some of the examples. Um, at the top right, here, these are some of the downloads that you could win if you did the quiz right. This is the, uh, the ratio ranking where you could figure out do I have enough points and what are my chances if I enter the competition? Um, some of the official uh, World Cup quiz that you could win. Um, apart from all of that, I just wanted to show you one other. Uh, video that shows a little bit of the activities that we did in the venue. Uh, just out of curiosity, did anybody go to a football match in the stadium here? Nope. See, that's how hard it was to get a team. So <laughs> let me show you uh, what happened uh, in the venue. It's shown through uh, television coverage of the event. Uh,
when we found out that Bolkitz was one of the uh, areas that uh, the Coca-Cola company uh, had as a property for activation, uh, we decided that that would be the perfect match with Aquarius, which is the number one sports drink in Japan. Um, so your dreams come true with Aquarius for kids to be part of the uh, World Cup and actually be participating in the World Cup uh, is, of course, a great opportunity. Um, the objective uh, for the Aquarius Bolkitz promotion was to strengthen the Aquarius brand image and uh, consumer interest and to activate the market and the stores so involve our customers and generate more shelf space. Um, and uh, the way to do that is to utilize the bulk kids program. It's targeted at uh, kids between 12 and 16 years of age, uh, male and female, and of course their parents, their family, and their chaperones from football clubs and so on and so forth. We ran it uh, very early in the year because we had to uh, get all their details, then they had to be trained, they had, uh, we had to make their uniforms and so on and so forth. So we had to actually do it early in order to get them ready on time. So we actually ran it right at the beginning of 2002. And it was across all channels, but especially um, with a special focus in the uh, supermarket, because that's where you reach the parents of these kids. Communication plan was um, pretty straightforward. You saw them already in that uh, footage. Uh, we used uh, Omoshiji as ambassador for the, uh, the program to reach football loving kids and their parents. So we had um, television commercial uh, with uh, Onosan um, in print. We also used this image uh, to explain more details about the program. We, um, through our relationship with the Ministry of Science and Education and JAWA, which is the Japan World Cup Organizing Committee, we managed to send posters of uh, the uh, Bull Kids program to 40,000 junior high and high schools. And we also sent a letter to the principal of each school to explain that his team could participate to become an official Bull Kid team in the uh, World Cup. Um, we sent direct mail out to um, all the 13-year-old uh, soccer players, registered 13-year-old soccer players in Japan, uh, the Old Japan Junior Football Competition, which is 8,400 teams, so it was a big mailing. And of course on the web we communicated our promotion. And actually after the promotion was finished, on the website we tracked the progress of each of the teams, so you could go there, if you were a fan of your local football team, you could find out how they were doing. And we did a media tie-up with two of the major television stations in Japan, um, and I'll explain it in a minute. This is, this is the key visual in uh, the poster and print. This is our web uh, presence. Um, and we uh, did a media tie with TBS Muscle Ranking and Mizamashi TV from uh, Fuji. And the objective there was to create really value for the brand. The, the problem of this promotion is that ultimately you have 32 bulk hits teams, so it's not a huge promotion in terms of participation. So in order to get value out of this expensive operation was to create um, uh, media value. And so we did a tie with these two television networks to strengthen brand aquarius and to give uh, uh, that uh, program a lot of publicity um, to maximize return on investment. Um, the other reason why we tie up, uh, did a tie up with the television networks is that if they explain it in a program, it's much easier to understand than we try to explain it in 50 second television commercials. So the, uh, the television tie up also made sure that people understood what all kids uh, was all about. Uh, we gave each uh, network their own match, so the ball kits for that particular match was selected uh, on uh, the 7th of June, it was England-Argentina, which was a huge match, of course, in Socorro, and TBS um, was the, the network that um, uh, found the ball kits for that match, and Japan-Russia, which was another really important match held in Yokohama on the 9th of June, that was the Fuji television match. And actually, uh, here at the bottom left, and you saw them on television there momentarily as well, um, one of the teams that qualified as a bulk hit team was actually an all-girls team. Uh, they were uh, from Yokohama, and um, uh, that became such a big story that even CNN made a story about the uh, female bulk hits team that uh, qualified for the World Cup. It's been reported also in the newspapers and in the, um, in the trade press. Um, our market share and also our volume uh, for the entire Coca-Cola Japan company group and all of its products did increase during World Cup more so than in previous years. So from that point of view, in terms of market share and volume, which means selling product, which was our basic um, uh, tool uh, that we wanted to use World Cup for, it definitely worked. Um, the promotion was incredibly successful. All of those promotion albums worked very, very well. Uh, promotion penetration is a very important measurement tool to find out if your promotion is working. Promotion penetration means how many stores are actually using your promotional material, which is measured. 
Um, and uh, we found that the promotion penetration, so the availability of all our promotions in all of the store, was double digit and in some cases close to 100%. So if we did a promotion with, let's say, 7-Eleven, 100% of stores carry that promotion. That's very rare. That's kind of what we call the magic or the power of World Cup because everybody wants to be part of it. You get these kinds of results. Um, and research results showed a very positive result for Coca-Cola Japan company brands. Um, this is from uh, public research, so I can show you this uh, numbers. As you can see, the top five brands that had the highest recognition at the end of the World Cup. Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Adidas, MasterCard, and Yahoo. Yahoo came on very strongly. The first line you see, the dark line, is before World Cup. Um, then the um, uh, yellow line, or the orange tag line here, is um, during World Cup. And this light blue line, sorry, it's a little bit difficult to see, is after World Cup. As you can see, Yahoo had a very strong increase um, uh, during and after World Cup. Before World Cup, it was very, very low. But they were the official um, World Cup website. So if you would go to the um, uh, official FIFA World Cup 2002 website, there was Yahoo all over that website. So that made obviously a very strong impact. Um, Adidas, of course, the sponsor of the national team and the supplier of the national team, they had a lot of uh, impact. And McDonald's as well, although they came from a very high uh, position at the beginning. But obviously we were happy to see that our uh, participation at the start was already the highest, but it increased close to 100% recognition after the event, so that was very good. And of course, we looked at our two main competitors, Keating and Centauri, and they were much, 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 much lower than we were. Um, and so that, uh, in that respect, our objective of differentiating ourselves from our competition worked also very well. Um, I think actually pictures are better than words. It's a little bit difficult to see, but here is a picture that one of my colleagues took when David Beckham was drinking our water. And the coach was drinking our coke from coke, uh, 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 is that one of the uh, paper cups? So that's, you know, you can't get better advertising than that. Um, we had our, um, uh, in the stage of our events, there were huge lines of people trying to participate in our events. Um, here are some uh, Brazilian Japanese fans cheering on their team by using Coca-Cola bottles. You can't get better advertising than that. And then, of course, Brazil won, and Japan had a really good result as well. So I think that kind of captures the magic of the uh, World Cup very well. So you might wonder, would you do it again? And I asked my boss, would you do it again? And Wotan San, who's the president of the College of Japan company, said, well, I wish every year was a World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> it works so well for a company that um, that would, uh, that would really help us, uh, so next year, 2003, will be uh, much tougher than, uh, than this year. Um, I have to do it again, because I'm moving to Germany as of end of next week, so um, would you do it again? Yes, I'm going to have to do it again uh, next year, so uh, we'll see you in Germany 2006. Thank you very much. <laughs>
maybe maybe in a normal year they take their most important customers for a golf game, and if it's a really important uh, customer, maybe to like Hawaii or Saipan or Guam or something like that. And we said, don't do that this year. This year, take them to World Cup. So use the money that you normally use for that type of event. Use it for this event. Uh, same with the uh, uh, brand team. Each brand team, every year, they organize a summer promotion, a spring promotion, a, a Christmas promotion for Coca-Cola. And we said, that's fine. So normally, maybe you use uh, Quata uh, for a concert series for your promotion. This year, use World Cup. So it didn't require additional money. It was just replacing your normal activity with World Cup. So that was kind of the strategy behind it. But I can't give you the exact number because that's confident, but it was very good for us. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, um, actually, um, this past World Cup was uh, hosted by two countries. Yes. So um, to do the exactly the same thing in Korea too, something like a ball case campaign. Yep. Get the, all the activities that you see here are part of our global conference. So as a host country, um, you automatically get those rights. Um, and so also in Korea, we did ball kits, we did flag bears, we did pins, we did um, um, customer programs and so on and so forth. And um, the, um, the programs are the same, but the, the marketing plans around them are totally different. Uh, there's huge differences between Korea and Japan, Coca-Cola. Um, in Japan, as I explained, we have about 26 brands. In Korea, we have seven brands. In Japan, um, we have Aquarius as our sports drink. In Korea, we have Powerade as our sports drink. So, um, in Japan, we are a very well-established company. In Korea, we're still a sort of growing company. So, there were so many differences between Korea and Japan that although the, the tools that we had were the same, the implementation of those plans were totally different. And we had a long discussion about that back in 99 when we started our plan, because initially we were thinking, well, maybe we create one World Cup team and that will deal with both Korea and Japan. But when we found out about these all these differences, it just didn't make sense. So we decided to really have two plans. And all the companies um, that are uh, partners with World Cup, but also FIFA itself, found out that they had to do it really times two. And that's why I said in the beginning, it was the first co-hosting event. But in, in reality, it meant hosting two World Cups in one year. And so for FIFA, it was also their resources were spreading perfectly thin. And so I don't think they'll ever do it again. Because the cost was double, the infrastructure was double, the resources required to do it was double. And so I don't think they'll do it again. Because it's, even though it was successful, it worked very well. But it was, in a sense, uh, two World Cups. And it's not worth it. Thank you very much. In France, just as an example, in France we have 10 venues. In Germany we'll have 10 or 12 venues. In Korea and Japan we have 20. So just that calculation, even if you think about all the hotels and all the campsites and everything else, it just didn't work. Any other questions? Why did we do this? Why did you not do that? Why were the referees so terrible? <laughs> <laughs> Why did Korea go further than Japan? <laughs> Why did Holland not qualify? But for I'm sorry. Very sad story. How do you think about those Olympic promotion? But we also do sports on Olympic. Yeah. How do you do the marketing things? Um, Olympics is totally different from World Cup. Um, and the reason is it is the Olympics is an event with multiple sports and World Cup is an event with one sport. So you either like soccer or you don't. And in the in the host country, like this year in Japan and Korea, typically what happens in our experiences and, and we've been doing this since nineteen seventy, our experience is that in the host country everybody goes crazy for the event. Even if you don't like football, you still go crazy for your for the event. And it's everybody between, let's say, 3 and, and 100 years old will get somehow involved in, in the event. But all the other countries, where they're not host country, but maybe participating country, but just a viewing country, it's a different story. If you don't like soccer, you're not going to watch the World Cup matches on TV. So the, the soccer uh, target or uh, a target profile in each country determines what kind of promotion you will do in that country. With Olympics, it's a little bit different story. If you think about the profile, for instance, Winter Olympics, of um, speed skating versus 
Ice dancing is completely different profile. Ice dancing is a very female target audience and, and it's, it's a completely different kind of um, um, atmosphere than speed skating, which is much more male dominated. And so around Olympics, you can do many different types of campaigns and you, and you can almost tailor it to your brand. So maybe um, speed skating is Aquarius and ice dancing is Diet Coke or Love Book because it's a totally different brand and it's a totally different uh, character for sport. So it allows you to do different things. So in that respect, they're completely different. Um, the only part that is the same is maybe customer hospitality, where you know we, you take people to a football match, you take people to the Olympics. So in terms of customer hospitality, it's, it's somewhat similar. There. The whole marketing program and the marketing mix and the way to approach it is very different. Both are very valuable, by the way, and expensive. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, kind of inverse just uh, from the big major political and social accidents like mine. Yeah, um, in August of um, 2001, we finalized our security plan. Uh, we had in 10 stadiums, we had about 500 people that were going to work there. Uh, we were going to have our key customers as guests at a lot of matches. So we wanted to make sure we had um, a good security plan for those people in case of an earthquake or some other natural disaster or something like that. And so we were finished in August and then on the, the September 11, we basically we threw that plan away and we had to start all over again because the whole, well, everything changed. And so the, the requirements for security from the government changed in terms of what they wanted. Um, the, the venues became much more difficult to access. We had to deliver product. In Japan, we made a um, very um, good uh, cooperation with uh, police and the uh, um, uh, security operations. In Korea, initially, because they were more worried in Korea because they were going to be the host country for the US team. And so in Korea, they said, if you bring product to the stadium, our security people will go with you to the plant we want to see you fill the bottles and then put them in a sealed truck and then deliver them to the stadium. And we said, we can't do that. The product is already made. And, and so we had to work through a lot of sort of new security measures. Um, the one thing that I was very irritated about with the Japanese security um, operation from uh, Jal was they seemed to think that the key security problem was going to be hooligans. The newspapers talked about hooligans. The, Television talked about hooligans, and um, we, again, we have a lot of experience with these events. We said to Japan, hooligans is not going to be a problem because you're an island nation, so you can control who comes in and out. Um, it, you're in a very expensive country, so a lot of people will not be able to afford to come to Japan, and you're very far away from everywhere. So there might be some, but it's not going to be this war that you are expecting to take place in, in Japan. And, um, and of course we were right, and, and, but that seemed to be the big thing that, that they were totally fixated on, on hooligan control. And that made our life very difficult because, not that we encourage hooliganism, but it means again that, you know, um, initially what they were telling us is you can only sell product in paper cups in the stadium. That may, that may sound like a good idea and a simple statement, but logistically that means that we have to pour our product. A lot of our product contains carbonation. If you pour the product, it doesn't stay carbonated as long as you have the product in a PET bottle. So in the end we came up with, well, if we sell the bottle open with the top off and with the paper cup on, then you know people can drink from the from the uh, bottle uh, when they are sort of near the concession stand, when they go to their seat, they have to pour it into the cup and then take the cup to their seat. Um, so that was the, the, the compromise that we could uh, reach. In the end, um, in, in the first few days, uh, people were stopped when they were trying to take a, a, a PET bottle into the stands when there was no problem because they were afraid that it was going to be thrown. They thought it was going to be a, an item that you could throw to players or the referee if you were unhappy with the result. When that never happened, then the security became a little bit more easy. And even though we showed them letters from France 98 and Euro 2000 from the National Police Commissioner from those countries saying PET bottles in the stadium has never been a problem, Japan police did not believe it and 
banned the product uh, like that from, from our city. The other logistical challenge with that is that it means that when you sell a product, you have to have people that take the top off, put the cup off, so the, um, the time per transaction slows down. In Japan um, organized committee had built stadiums on a Um, 20 seconds per transaction model. So each transaction would take 20 seconds. And we said, that doesn't work because you'll have foreigners who don't know the currency and you'll have people that want to buy multiple products. So, and, and by the way, the 20 seconds per transaction was based on baseball matches. So we said, it's totally different. You can't compare it. And, and our learnings from past experience is it's going to be about 60 seconds per transaction. And that's a, that's a quick transaction. And of course, during um, some of the test uh, events uh, where um, the friendly matches the Japan national team played, we saw huge lines in front of the uh, concession stand. Again, we want to sell product. You know, that, that's our mission. So the, the quicker we can do it, the happier our concessionaire, because that's not our business, that's the concessionaire's business, and the happier we are. And so after the last friendly match, and, and we took video from what was happening, and, and it just didn't work. And so. Literally one month before the event started, we reached an agreement with um, with Jao to create additional sales points. He said, "Actually, not having enough sales points is a security problem as well. If you have people standing in long lines and different fan groups from two countries start standing in the same line and, and they can't get a drink and they're getting pissed off about it, that's a security problem. And that's our experience from the past. But again, the, the, those kinds of things." You know, it's difficult to admit that maybe somebody else knows it better than you do. And, and the you know, Japanese police and the Japan local organizing community said, no, 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 this is Japan, this is how it works. And we said, well, here's 30 years of experience with these events, this is our experience. And that just didn't translate. It was very difficult. And only until the last minute we kind of solved the problem. So it's uh, a lot of different aspects to this uh, event, other than just some nice marketing and advertising. <laughs> Anybody else? I just had a quick question. I have a marketing background as well, but I've not seen that before. But one of the main things that struck me was that the main success of this was that, that it was a total integrated marketing communications approach. I mean, you had event marketing, advertising, media, um, PR, everything was integrated, right? That's, that's our model that we're using. It's um, what we call um, integrated communications. And um, as I said before, the simple calculation of one plus one is three is what we're trying to accomplish. And by orchestrating everything around the same kind of theme and the same um, model uh, allows you to, uh, to accomplish that. We were very successful with that. What was your particular role in this whole setup? Um, in, in construction terms, uh, main architect and a uh, supervisor of building the actual building. So basically anything that you saw here, ultimately I was and responsible for. So whether our customers were beaten up by, by hooligans or whether our sales promotion campaign with Lawson didn't work or not, that was, all of that was uh, my responsibility. Yeah. And will be again. Mm -hmm. Or continues to. Our World Cup is a great opportunity to, to uh, promote your products, your brand name. And, uh, so that uh, other uh, compete and other competitor like to participate like a board and have do you manage to contract with Twitter in such a long time? Um, well, first of all, that, that, there's a legal answer to that question, which is the 165-page contract. <laughs> that contract is very specific, and, uh, and one of the, the things that's in the contract, which is a very typical um, rule for contracts that we do with events or um, um, celebrities or whatever, is um, what we call the first right of refusal. So it means that when the contract expires, you get the first opportunity to renew the contract. Um, if you don't want it anymore, then someone else may buy it. 
And so we have a first right of refusal on the contract as a whole and also on many of the elements here. So let's say that uh, for 2006 we're not interested in doing bulk hits anymore. Then we have to release it and they can give it to another partner. Uh, they cannot give it to any sponsor outside of the World Cup uh, partnership. So if we decided for whatever reason that we weren't interested in uh, bulk hits anymore, then MasterCard can do it or McDonald's can do it. But, so we have first right of refusal on the whole. Uh, property and on uh, specific parts of the property. The other thing that is very, very um, painful is ambush. Um, in Japan, we have huge problems with Kirin. Uh, Kirin is the sponsor of the national team, as you all know, and they did a very, very good job of activating the national team. But we took them on a number of occasions, uh, not to court, because in Japan you can't really take them to court. In other countries we would have taken them to court. In, in Japan we had to take them to JAL or FIFA to complain about what they were doing, and to the Japan Football Association. Because they were not legally ambushing the event, but they were creating the impression with um, uh, Japanese uh, consumers that they were somehow related to the event. They were related to the national team. The national team was participating in the event. But they could not use anything saying World Cup or whatever. So the only thing they kept on saying was 2002. And if you look at uh, the official FIFA logo, it actually uses the 2002 as part of their um, registered trademark. So we had three occasions where we complained about the uh, feeding activity, and three occasions where FIFA um, then complained to the Japan Football Association, who was giving the sponsorship to Kirin. and. Kirin paid an incredibly stupid amount for uh, the national team. They paid so much that they're still suffering from it financially now. If you've read sort of the um, recent sort of um, uh, quarterly results and whatever, Kirin is suffering because they paid huge amounts for World Cup and did a lot of marketing around it, which they had to do because they bought it, so they, they should use it. But then at the same time, there's a huge beer war going on in uh, Japan as well, so they're also having to invest a lot of uh, activity beer. So it, it's really damaged their financial results in, in quite a bad way. Um, that's their mistake. But Kirin has, has been really trying very hard to, to get the most out of that, uh, that sponsorship. Um, and um, the other problem that we had is that Kirin in Japan is also the distributor of Budweiser. And Budweiser is an official partner. So that means that through the Budweiser um, distribution deal, Kirin could access the official uh, partner workshops. So they knew exactly what we were doing. Um, and that was something we couldn't stop because it went from you know, the partner workshop through the Budweiser representatives in Japan straight to Kirin. <laughs> so it made our life very difficult. Um, and I've heard it's going to be somewhat the same in Germany where Budweiser also is very, very small and they have a German bottler who distributes their product, so we might have the same situation again in 2006. Um, having said that, um, you saw from the, uh, the result that um, ultimately, uh, compared to uh, Coca-Cola, Kirin didn't get the same kind of credit and mileage out of it. And we think the mistake they made is that they used their sponsorship as a corporate sponsorship. They didn't advertise products with World Cup, they advertised Kirin as a company name. Um, with, with, with work. If you remember that the Kirin Enjoy Sports campaign, they had the national team and Kirin Enjoy Sports. There was, there was no sell of a specific beer or a specific soft drink or tea or whatever. They, they used it as a corporate tool. And, and that I think has been a mistake that they, they, they didn't tie it back to sales. They sold Kirin as a name. I think most Japanese people know about Kirin. So <laughs> then that, that was not necessary. I think that's the mistake. I understand nowadays, uh, especially in the Japanese market, the Coca-Cola, the number one uh, competitor of Coca-Cola is, is not Pepsi anymore, probably Aquarius or Sokin Nicha, mm -hmm. um, probably you're beating each other uh, from, from the same yeah. the company. How do you, I mean, balance between, I mean, among them, especially when you do the advertising in, in um, uh, yeah, we call it share of thirst. If you're thirsty, 
we want to drink something, we want to make sure it's one of our brands. We don't care. It doesn't matter. No. Um, each brand manager is very passionate about this brand. <laughs> <laughs> and as a company, you know, it's share of thirst. If, if you want to drink water, that's fine, as long as it's how... If you want to drink juice in the morning at your breakfast, that's fine, as long as it's two minutes and, and, so, and so on. So, share of thirst is what it is. And that's also, for instance, with Roadmap, why we decided to use the promotion mechanism across all of our brands that were relevant with World Cup. I mean, some brands, like Minute Maid, is a, is a product that doesn't link very well with the, with the values of World Cup, so we left that one out. But our, our soft drinks, our teas, which are, you know, th those are typically products that um, have a, a high, what we call, uh, immediate consumption per, uh, percentage. Um, they were part of that uh, promotion. And we also consciously left Georgia out. Um, Georgia was not part of it. Um, and that was a conscious decision. In hindsight, I'm still wondering if, what would have happened if we would have decided not to do it. But Georgia has a very, very strong campaign in Japan right now, which just didn't link very well into World Cup. We did make a football commercial for Georgia, and maybe you will have seen it when we uh, you know, launched the European blend uh, flavor. And we had um, a commercial where um, uh, Hamada san went to Paris to a trade show and he oh. suffered because he didn't speak any French <laughs> and he was totally ignored and he was sitting in his hotel room at night and he was totally disappointed about his failure in Paris and then he saw Onusan score a goal in Europe and he thought, well, if he can score, then I should be successful as well. So we did make a, a football commercial that didn't relate to, to the World Cup. Um, but it, that's, that, was a, that is sort of our approach. We ultimately we want to be a product relevant across the whole beverage spectrum. Rather than just in one thing. You're absolutely right. I mean, Pepsi is probably one of our smallest competitors here in the market. We compete in, in tea and coffee and, uh, and in sports drinks. If you look at the, this is also something that I, in the beginning, had a lot of difficulty explaining to my colleagues abroad is that um, in Japan, I sell more coffee and tea than soft drinks. And so I'm predominantly in the coffee and tea business, <laughs> and then maybe in the soft drink business. And, Everywhere else in the world, it's the other way around. We are predominantly in the software business, and maybe we sell some, well, mostly tea. So that's a completely different business. Well, of all the goods that uh, Coca-Cola produced for the World Cup, what would you say was the uh, uh, most successful, and what would you say it might have been a mistake? Now, the most successful was something that we didn't make, was uh, tickets. Um, we gave away 2,002 pair tickets, so 4,004 tickets. That was more than any other partner gave away. That took four years of negotiation with FIFA because the, you know, the number of tickets that anybody can buy is limited and it's, it's very difficult. But we said we, we cannot show with like 500 tickets because nobody will believe that they have a chance to win a ticket. So it's, it's, then it's not valuable. And so, if I would have had 8,008 pair of tickets, I could have given those away as well. I mean, you can't have enough tickets. When I came here in 99, and everybody was talking about, well, what should be the promotion mechanism? I said, tickets, everybody's going to be tickets. How original is tickets? You know, let's come up with something else. And we did research. People don't want anything else. <laughs> tickets. <laughs> tickets, is it? <laughs> so, uh, we did a ticket promotion, and then we decided, okay, well, if it has to be tickets, then it has to be the biggest ticket promotion of everybody else, and it has to be, also, it has to be the last ticket promotion. So we pushed it right until the end of the, of the campaign. So we were, the, the campaign was literally your last chance to win a ticket to the World Cup. So that worked very, very well. Um, you asked what, what didn't work, or... or um, Not, it's not so much what didn't work, but what we found ultimately that was a lot of work and maybe not worth the effort because it was complicated to execute was a lot of local city events. Um, and again, that was mostly due to security. Um, especially in host cities, the police was stretched so thin that when you wanted to do like a public viewing event or you wanted to do some, some other type of event, is that you know you went through the whole process of, of, of creating it, organizing it, finding the right partners, and so on and so forth. And we literally had, and I think it was Yokohama, where like two days before the event was taking place, police said, sorry, we can't give you the people, and you have to cancel it. 
And so that happened a few times, and that was that made life very difficult. It was just because the I, you know the police resources and, and the, the the city resources were stretched so thin that it just it just they couldn't deal with it. And so that was something that if we would have known that beforehand, we could have saved ourselves maybe some time and money and, and effort in, in, in creating those uh, types of events. Anything else? Yeah, how did uh, marketing go over abroad outside of Japan and outside our of Korea? Here. Right. Um, well, given our results, we're the darling of everybody because it worked very, very well, both in Japan and Korea, by the way. Both Japan and Korea had like record the first six months of the year. Um, actually, Korea did even better than we did, um, and that was because the team obviously stayed in the competition longer. Um, and globally, um, and, and I'm going to see the final results in, uh, in November in, in Germany, um, the 32 participating countries, and the countries that didn't qualify were typically strong football countries. Um, Results were, were extremely high, and um, you know every country did their ticket promotion, and, and that was that was always very successful because again that's what people want, and especially when you're let's say living in Brazil or Mexico, and it's it's basically impossible to see yourself going to to Japan because you can't afford a flight, you can't afford anything. Um, you know ticket promotions, buying a simple coke, and then having having a dream of going to World Cup is a very, very powerful mechanism. So it works very, very well. And, and so these, that's why we keep doing these events. As long as you can make them relevant as a sales tool, not just as a arguably fantastic tool, but a sales tool, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to keep doing them. As long as the, the business result is better than the money you invested in when you're doing it. Right. <coughs> is, is your counterpart in Korea going to meet you in Germany? Um, he is coming to Germany to present his um, art traction review presentation, and um, he is actually, after he finished his assignment on World Cup, is taking on a similar job as I have here, sort of looking after media, um, event sponsorship, marketing, PR, so an integrated communications model. Korea didn't have that before in Japan, I started that in 99. Um, basically, Korea, um, by looking at what we have done and by uh, seeing how World Cup can do that kind of an integration has now decided that hey, we should do that on an ongoing basis. So the guy that did that for World Cup is going to lead that effort in that. Yeah. So you're you're going to be stationed in Germany. <coughs> yes, I'll be in um, Essen, Germany, which is where our office is. Mm -hmm. Did you know? Did you have a special campaign planned if uh, Japan had won? Yes, we had. Um, <laughs> That was interesting, that's a funny story actually. Um, we had our um, final planning meeting in October of 2001, and I said, well, why don't Japan reach the next stage? And the World Cup team, the brand team, they all said, that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you're very pessimistic. But let's say a miracle happens, and you know, we should have some sort of uh, solution for it. You know, we need to have something ready for it. So we had um, a campaign and a continuation, a contingency for, for that uh, eventuality. Um, we also had a campaign ready for when Japan would crash out. We had, you know, thank you Japan campaign uh, ready to, to go. Um, but uh, it wasn't necessary because uh, thank God they reached the next round. And, and I was convinced they were going to reach the next round, but all my colleagues were not. And so we actually, in that meeting, we placed a bet on it. And I got a lot of money. <laughs> I'm personally very happy with the result of the national team. Okay, well thank you very much.